Coming up on Juice and Java, we have the latest on the Whitman School of Management scandal. We'll also talk all things homecoming from fashion trends to exactly how the tradition started. And Courtney Jones will be joining us to talk about all of the upcoming events from Orange After Dark. And what is SU doing to combat Red Zone Week? We'll have that and more. Stay with us. Welcome to Juice and Java, I'm Jeff Slauson. And I'm Kayla Spector. Let's head to the juiciest, sto juiciest stories from this week in The Squeeze. Kenneth Kavayitz, the now former dean of Whitman at SU, was arrested on Tuesday on a charge of patronizing a prostitute. He has since been put on administrative leave from his faculty position until further notice. He had been the dean of Whitman for more than three years. Kavayitz was known for being very passionate about student academic integrity. Now I know for me this was pretty shocking when it comes to the idea that he was the dean, was doing very well, and then all of a sudden, boom, it comes out that there's a scandal, there's an issue. Yeah, you know, I was so surprised. I think so many students were shocked about everything that happened. No one was expecting it. It was, no one knew how to react to it. And there's the idea that there's scandals, but then when you find out that it's prostitution and it's somebody that's in an academic position, that's I'm terrifying to think about that the university would allow something like that to be going on or not know about it. Well, you just question who actually knew about it until it came out this week that now all the students know about it. Did any faculty know? So it's a scary thought to think that we were all in the dark with this. One thing I will say, though, I applaud the university on the fact that they went out and said, okay, it's, or at least it was come out and said that it's prostitution instead of allowing the rumors to fly that had been flying since, what was it, last Wednesday. Um, yeah. So I, I think that was definitely something that was very positive from the university. Yes, I completely agree. And on another note, rape culture on college campuses does not seem to be improving. Delaney Robinson, a student at the University of North Carolina, has accused a UNC football player, Alan Artis, of raping her. Robinson claims that she was treated like a suspect, being asked accusatory questions while Artis was treated as an innocent football player. This problem persists across the country, as a frat at the University of Richmond recently sent out an email including the phrase, quote, tonight's the type of night that makes fathers afraid to send their daughters away to school, end quote. The Kappa Alpha chapter has since been suspended. I think this is just unbelievable to think about that this is still occurring. And I don't know if you caught this last night, but the Rice marching band actually joined together and made a nine on the field when they were playing Butler, uh, Baylor, and we all know how Baylor has dealt with sexual assault in the past. So the fact that this is still occurring, it's still going on, and being hidden is just astonishing, absolutely you, astonishing. You'd think these college campuses would really try to combat this a lot more. I feel like there's not a lot going on on all of these campuses everywhere, whether these problems are happening or not on your campus. It's surprising that people aren't taking enough action to do something about it. And it's it's nice that it's been starting to come up and be more of a recurring thing in the fact that people are finding out, but at the same time, it's gotta stop. It has to end, and it has I to end soon. I completely agree. A recent study shows that only 39% of Americans think that Hillary Clinton is fit to be the next president of the United States after contracting pneumonia. Her physician assured everyone, saying she, quote, continues to remain healthy and fit to serve as president of the United States, end quote. However, many people still believe that a presidential candidate should publicly release their medical records. 63% of people think that Donald Trump is healthy enough. So I guess I'll position you in this. Do you think that the medical records should be released and should we know every single thing that's happened with all these candidates? You know, I personally don't think we need to know every single thing about them. They're obviously fit to become president. If they weren't, they wouldn't be in the running. So I think, yeah, we should know the basics. We should know that they're obviously healthy and doing well, but I don't think we need to know everything that's going on in their lives. You know, we know what we need to know. Have you been sick in the past year? I think I have. So can you imagine campaigning for however many months or, you know, for a, a, almost a year, and you don't get sick one day? I mean, it's is that impossible. Fair, is that fair to assume that you can't be sick for a day? It's impossible. Exactly. And it's not fair for all of these people to assume that, oh, she has pneumonia, so now she's out. Right. And how do you say that about someone? And I know this was an issue a while ago, in like 2008 with John McCain, and it's always been an issue, but come on. Like, she got sick for pneumonia, just leave it alone. Let's get to the politics and what's really mattering right now, and that's you know, electing a new granted president. Granted, she was also standing in the heat on 9-11, and everyone just wasn't happy about the fact that she couldn't stand in the heat, like so many other people there. And I think that's not fair to her. I agree, I agree. 
And the Green Party nominee Jill Stein and Libertarian Gary Johnson will not be participating in the presidential debate on September 26th. This means that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump will be the only two on stage Monday night. Johnson remains positive, saying that he hopes to be on the debate stage in October. So what do you think about these other nominees? Do you think that they should be on the debate stage? Well, I think it's funny. I, I think if you went around and asked people who is Jill Stein, they would not guess the Green Party candidate for president. People know who Gary Johnson is, but there's a fear among parties, obviously, in the fact that, oh, I can't leave my party because whoever I'm going to be going for is not going to end up being elected. Mm -hmm. So I understand that there are some people that are a little annoyed that you have to be up to 15% in the polls in order to be considered for a debate. But at the end of the day, these third party candidates just can't really make a difference. So to me, it doesn't really matter. I want to see the two heavy hitters go at it. I agree. I do think that these two, Jill Stein and Gary Johnson, are both trying really hard to be in the running. So I think they should maybe have a fair chance of debating. So maybe in October, they'll get to be on the debate stage. But I think they should have a fair chance to just say their thoughts and what they want to do. So would you think maybe they could have a third party candidate debate you for know, the I two of them? I think that would be a great idea. I don't know why they've never done that. Uh, you know, maybe I should be maybe running. Maybe should suggest that. doing it then, I guess. Maybe you should run. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Burke Ramsey is being accused by people on social media for killing his sister, John Bonet Ramsey. After smiling through an interview about her with Dr. Phil, this was the first time he had a media interview about her, about her 20 years after the unsolved murder took place. However, Dr. Phil is defending him, saying the smile was just nerves and that he was socially anxious, and adding that there is no normal protocol for someone who is grieving to act. Dr. Phil added that Ramsey just wants to find his sister's killer. I saw the video, you saw the video, do you think that he was showing guilt? Do you think it was You know, remorse? I think it's hard to tell. This has been going on for so long. I mean, the murder was 20 years ago. And to think that it's unsolved till now, I, I hate hearing about any cases that it takes so long to solve something like this, because it's awful. And like, what about the family? Like, they want closure, I think. I just have trouble dealing with the fact that this is it's been unsolved for so long. Well, the thing is, like, the Ramsey case is the new OJ case, too. Yeah. Last year, the media had a firestorm on the OJ case, and it was huge, and everybody loved it because it was great TV. So now that's, this is the new one. This is the Ramsey case is the new one. So obviously, he's going to be brought into the limelight, and obviously, he's going to have to be answering questions he doesn't want to answer. So when seeing the video, it looked like it was nerves. I don't think you can incriminate someone on just smiling awkwardly throughout an interview. Um, I'm sure if I sat down with Dr. Phil, I'd probably squeal like a little girl in <laughs> happiness. So um, I, I don't know if it shows guilt or whatever. I just don't think that I, anybody can really say. Yeah, I mean, I think you can't judge someone's, if they're guilty or not guilty, based on the faces that they're making. You know, I'm sure he was so anxious, so nervous in the moment. How can you just accuse him because of that? Like, there needs to be more to back it up. I agree. And at the box office, it looks like Sully will be holding its spot at first place for the second week in a row. The movie, which stars Tom Hanks, is at $21 million at 3,525 locations. And in second place is the horror sequel, The Blair Witch Project. And at third is Universal's Bridget Jones' Baby. Coming in fourth place is Open Road's biopic Snowden. So did you go out to the movies and see any of these recently? I have not. I'm dying to see Sully, though. Mm -hmm. I've heard great things about it. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, so it's Clint Eastwood, Tom Hanks. Like, looks like a great cast. It seems like it'd be a great movie, but I really want to see it. And the fact that it's been the top for the past two weeks shows that it's definitely good, right? Yeah, it's definitely a top movie out there. I think it's definitely worth going and paying at the theater. So would you see any of the top four soon? Will you be seeing Blair Witch by any chance? You know, I'm not really into movies like that. The creepy aspect is a little bit much for me, but I would definitely go see uh, Bridget Jones' Baby. I you can see that one and just tell me how it is, I guess. I, I, <laughs> I, I, think, I think leaning toward the solo would be more of my forte, but still, still seems like a fine movie. Um, I think also the idea that like you're dealing with all these different movies right now too, so Sully's gonna clearly take the top spot when it's biographical. Well, yes, I think we can expect Sully to stay right. in the top place compared to all these other movies. I'm sure they're all great, and I'd right. love to see all of them, but I think Sully will definitely stay up there. I will try and see it, and then I'll let you know yeah. as soon as that happens. I would love and to after the break, our very own KJ Vaughn will be here to discuss how the tradition of homecoming really began. And ever wonder where everyone gets the cutest tailgating wear? Remy Lutcher will be joining me to give you the scoop. Stay with us.
changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly I found my voice and learned all the way I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. Hey, look, it's those guys. Uh, Are you good to drive? I'm fine. How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be? Go and step out of the vehicle for me. See ya, buddy. Good luck. So it turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing. And it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. SU has many great traditions that define our university, but do you know how they all began? One of those traditions is Homecoming Week. KJ Vaughn is here to tell us how all of that really started. KJ? Thanks, guys. Saturday's game against the University of South Florida is Syracuse's homecoming game to culminate Orange Central or Homecoming Week. But where did the origin for Homecoming Week come from? Well, to get that answer, we have to jump back over a century to 1911. This is when the University of Missouri hosted rival Kansas. And to help get fan turnout up, U of M athletic director Chester Brewer decided to invite the alums home for the game. This is what University of Missouri claims as the first homecoming of any sort in the country. However, Baylor and the University of Illinois both claim that their first homecoming, homecoming games were earlier than 1911. Baylor's was first in 1909 when they hosted Goodwill Week, which would eventually morph into a homecoming type celebration. Illinois hosted theirs one year later in 1910. So it seems as these three universities, Baylor, Missouri, and Illinois, can lay claim to the idea of homecoming. But if you look even earlier than 1909, several universities, Michigan, Harvard, have you know, homecoming type festivities, bonfires, parades, but they just didn't center around a football game. As for Syracuse, I was actually unable to find when Syracuse started homecoming. However, I did find that it dates back to 2007, their idea to combine alumni week and homecoming into what has morphed into Orange Central week, which is what we're celebrating now. And interestingly enough, in terms of homecoming games that Syracuse played in, I was able to find that all the way back in 1926, Syracuse spoiled rival Penn State's homecoming game. So there's definitely a lot of history surrounding it, and it's, you know, kind of controversial, I guess. And when we come back, Red Zone Week is coming up soon on campus. What events will be held? All that and more, we'll see you right here in a minute. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. I want to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I need to eat, eat, 
eat apples and bananas. Why can't I eat, eat, eat? One in five children struggles with hunger in America. Support the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks to help provide meals five. to those who need them. Join us at feedingamerica.org. Welcome back. I have Nicole Sherwood, the president of Panhellenic, joining me to discuss Red Zone Week. So, Nicole, can you just give me a synopsis of what Red Zone Week is? Yeah, absolutely. So, this year we're going to be putting on a week-long of events from October 3rd to October 7th that is going to raise awareness about the Red Zone, which is the first six weeks on campus when students are most likely to encounter sexual assault. Um, we really wanted to do this in October because we thought that this was a good time, kind of in the middle of that period, and it was a good time to put on events to target freshmen and people who are already on campus. Yeah, so I know the big idea about this is that a, a huge number of sexual assaults happen at the beginning of the school year yes. on college campuses. Mm -hmm. So October would be a good time to have that because Absolutely. you're kind of already transitioned into the school year. Mm -hmm. You have enough time to get adjusted, but it's still this huge issue that we really need to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So what type of events will you be holding the week Yes. Yeah. So basically we're trying to raise awareness. It's not as much event-based as it is awareness-based. Um, so we're going to be doing bar stamps at all of the bars that are going to have messages of consent. So when you go out that week, you'll get stamps from Harry's, Chuck's, all those different bars. We'll also be handing out wristbands that say, our community, our responsibility. Um, we'll be doing a quad display. That's going to be a big deal. Um, we also have a speaker coming in one night to talk about pornography and its um, effect on sexual violence. Um, and really, it's just a matter of like raising awareness about this issue. But it's really cool because we have all the Greek councils getting involved in it. That's great. Yeah. It's so good to have so much of campus involved. Absolutely. I feel like that the Greek community it plays a large part on our yeah. college campus. And I think having all those people involved will really show us how important this issue is. Yeah. And I think that's a great idea with the stamps at the bars mm -hmm. to have the message. Yeah. You know what? Um, and thank you so much for being here. I know the Red Zone Week events sound like they'll be very fun and very informative and a very important yeah. message to send out. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Yeah. And we'll be right back after this short break. My resignation letter. You're resigning. Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you read stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. OK, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> We're gonna go out there in the rain. Gonna get wet. All right, here we go. Oh, look at the rain. Okay, quick. Oh, yeah. Yes. So much fun. Yeah, are your children in the right car seat for their age and size? It may be too late to check when you're on the road. Fortunately, you're on the couch. Don't think you know. Know you know. So, same time next week? Well, of course. Have you ever wondered about the fun activities around CUSE? Well, I have Courtney Jones joining me to discuss all the activities Orange After Dark has planned for this year. Now, Courtney, Orange After Dark has been very successful, yes. drawing students, getting some great events going. So tell us a little bit about the stack you guys have ready for this year. Yeah, well, this uh, fall semester, we actually have more events than we've ever had in the past. This is our, our busiest semester. We're really excited about it. We have a lot of um, classic Orange After Dark events, old favorites coming back, but we also have a lot of new ones that we're really excited about as well. So why this year are you rolling out so many events as opposed to the past few years? Yeah, because we've just uh, been hearing from students uh, through their, their power of, of sales and tickets uh, that that's what they're looking for. They're looking for more events, they're looking for more opportunities, they're looking for more events, more ways to get off campus, more ways to socialize and interact with each other. So we just wanted to throw everything at them that we possibly could. So what are some of these old favorites that you're bringing back? And then what yeah. are some new ones that might get more students in because they're so different and unique? Absolutely. So we are hosting an event at uh, Dave & Buster's at the mall 
always goes really well, always sells out really quickly, um, mostly because it's a really low cost event. It's $3 and you get to go play all the games. It's an unlimited buffet. So that's a great one. We do that every semester. And then a new one that we're doing is an escape the room game. So those are really popular all over the country now. They've been popping up everywhere. And we're actually bringing a company in to do our own on campus in the student center. So in the student center, they're going to be setting up a full escape room? Yeah, four of them actually. So that's going to be really exciting. That's they're going to be awesome. unique to us. So I'm um, really excited about that one as well. Now, will it be orange themed or is it going to be a detective theme? Because I, I did one in uh, New York City where it was detective style, like yeah. 1950s. It was really, really cool. Yeah, yeah I think they're all actually going to be different themes. So awesome. depending on uh, which one you get into, um, you can play more than one, um, escape all of them. That's, that is, see, that's something that's very unique, and I feel I like most so. schools won't be able to offer something like that. Well, our school is better than theirs. All right, so <laughs> obviously all of the events are great, but what is your favorite event that will be happening this year? Wow, oh, that's difficult. Um, I mean, I love all of them. We're going back to um, Fright Night at the Fair. That one always does really well. That's a really large capacity event for us. We take um, upwards of five, 600 students to that event. Um, that's a really great one, and, and even though I particularly am not a fan of being really scared, if so many of our students really enjoy I'm Halloween that, season yeah. and, and that opportunity. So um, we're going to another one at Sylvan Beach Amusement Park, which is a local, like 30 minutes away amusement park. They're doing another Halloween-themed Fright Night. So we're doing a lot of, uh, of those for this fall and hoping those go well as well. Too. How far in advance are you guys planning out these events? Do you plan it out a yeah. year in advance or is it two years? How, what's the time span? Yeah, for that? we generally plan a semester in advance. So we planned this fall's lineup all summer. We'll plan this upcoming spring's uh, lineup uh, a little bit later this fall. We have a new um, Orange After Dark event team that's going to help us with that. We're really interested in getting uh, this programming to be you know, for students, by students. And so we're really excited to have their input. And obviously, you have great plans ready. So anything on the horizon yeah. that, that's in the works that we can uh, know now? I don't have any insider information for you, unfortunately, but um, we'll have we'll have a stacked lineup again. Um, lots of stress busters for the spring. Um, spring finals tend to be really stressful, so we'll definitely get a lot of those uh, breaks in there for you. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. Absolutely. I'm going to be on the lookout for that escape room. Uh, try and good. beat it in 45 minutes. <laughs> that's right. Hughes Clothing. Clothing options? Well, Remy Loopcher is joining me to discuss all the hot styles for this season. So, you run this by yourself? Yes. So, my company is called Snipped and Styled by Remy Lube. That's me. And I started this entirely on my own, and I have a few employees now because it's really grown to something I wouldn't even ever imagined it would become. So, how big has it become now? So, I say I would get anywhere from, depend. it really depends on when game day is, but I can get anywhere from 50 orders to 200 orders a week. Wow, that's insane. So do you only do it for Syracuse students or do you reach out to other colleges? So I've actually, due to social media, become, um, you know, quite spread quite widely all over campuses all over the country. I actually just recently had an article about me published in Brazil. So I have people reaching out to me in um, Portuguese about you know, speaking about snips and styled in Brazil, so that's kind of crazy. So you make all of these shirts completely on your own. Have you taught other people how to make them too? So I actually just recently started to delegate to some other people, and um, they do have to sign non-competes and not, you know, they promise not to disclose any tricks of the trade. However, um, some people have been able to help me because it really has just become so large. So these are a few of the shirts that you have made, so I know like the back of this is twisted and I yes. don't think I would ever be able to do that on my own. <laughs> so, and this one is braided. So how many different styles do you make? Do you have so a lot of different ones? Yeah, so I obviously have ones that are more popular than others and stuff like that, but I have about 10 shirt styles and five sweatshirt styles and then I've also um, branched out to doing sweatpants and then bando tops because if you're gonna wear a backless shirt like this, you need something to wear popular. under that. Yeah. <laughs> so, is there anything else you're looking to maybe do with this company that you've made? Like, do you want to expand it even more? I would love that. It, it has really grown so much, um, you know, since I started it. I couldn't have even imagined what it would turn into. And I would love to expand, and I would love to one day have this be my full-time career. 
And why did you even start this company? I mean, it's an amazing thing. It's grown so huge. So what made you start it at the beginning? So when I got into Syracuse as um, a high school senior, it was early decision. I got into Newhouse. I was so excited. I um, did not want to wear a boring, plain T-shirt that said Syracuse on it that was unisex. Anyone could wear it. It didn't really have anything special about it. So I took a scissor to my clothing and Snipped and Styled was born. And people stopped me in the hallways of college and stuff like that um, and asked me to do this to their shirts. And that's kind of how it all began. And did you ever make anything like this before you got to college? Did you have any experience with <laughs> making clothes like this? If you ask my mom, she will tell you when I was really young. I don't know what I was thinking. I took a scissor to one of my good shirts and she was very angry about it. But we had a huge fight and we joke about it now because if she ever knew what it would turn into, uh, <laughs> She no, wouldn't have been so angry. Great, something huge. Cause, exactly. Because I know I, I've i tried to cut my shirts, and I definitely can't do it. So it's amazing that you have learned how to do this. Thank you. Um, and how many people do you have working for you now? At any given time, I have three to four employees. OK, and they're all from Syracuse? Or have yes. you, are you going to reach out to getting employees on other campuses? So right now, I need to be able to um, you know, look, look over the girls and really mm -hmm. hold their hands. But once um, I can, like, release the reins a little bit, maybe other campuses. But right now, I love when my girls come to my apartment and we work together hand in hand. And I've become such close friends with these girls. They're not just employees. They're amazing. They work with me. I don't. I like to say they work with me, not for me, because that's so important. That's great. And do you think you're going to continue this after college? Is this something you'll keep doing? I would love that. Um, Snipped and Styled's my baby. Whether or not I continue with this exact premise or something else, it's always going to be a part of me. I've grown so much, and the company has grown with me. Well, that's so great. Thank you so much for being here. I would love to have one of these shirts. They all look amazing. Of course. Thank and you. And we'll for be right me. back to talk about everybody's favorite apple, the Honeycrisp. There's one thing you can never have sex without it's not something you buy, or something you take. In fact, there's only one way to get it it has to be given to you freely. It's consent. Because sex without it isn't sex. It's rape. Consent. If you don't get it, you don't get it. It's on us to stop sexual assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. And it looks like we might have to wait a couple more weeks for some delicious Honeycrisp apples. Beacon Skiff Apple Orchard said Monday on their Facebook page that the apples, quote, aren't quite ready yet and that they will be ready when they are ready. And they hope the apples will be ready by the end of September, adding that the Honeycrisps crisps are their favorite apple, too. So is a Honeycrisp your favorite apple? Honeycrisp is hands down my favorite apple. See, I disagree. Um, I T typically we'll eat them uh, very often on occasion when I p pick up an apple, but like we said, not really that into uh, breakfast or whatever it is. And before we say goodbye, we want to leave you with our top songs of this week. We do not want to do that, actually. <laughs> we actually want to mark the end of this episode of Juice and Java, so thank you so much for joining us today, and remember to tune in again next Saturday for more news, pop culture, and entertainment. We still will not have the top songs then. Uh, for that, I am Jeff Slauson. I'm Kayla Spector. From all of us here at Citrus TV, have a happy homecoming, Syracuse.